Hello, welcome to Archaeology 101. Today's topic, we won't be looking at any authentic archaeology. We are going to be diving down the rabbit hole, which is the Piltdown hoax. If we are to discuss Piltdown, we have to put ourselves in the context of when the hoax occurred in the early 20th century, which will allow us to understand how the hoax was able to occur and was able to carry on for as long as it did. Prior to 1912, when the Piltdown remains were officially released to the world, the human fossils that had been discovered prior to then were a fraction of what we have today. The first non-sapiens fossils discovered were that of the Neanderthals, and they were accepted as a new species in 1859. Although this species was seen as an evolutionary dead end, and it was often badly caricatured as a dullard and unsophisticated, a reputation which hung around well into the mid-20th century. The second hominin to be revealed was right at the end of the 19th century. In 1898, Francis Dubois in his travels in Java published the findings of Java Man, which we would now recognise as Homo erectus. And it would be in 1921 when more substantial remains of Homo erectus were found in the form of Peking Man. The third major fossil discovery was in 1907, and that was the discovery of the Mauer jaw. This was found in Heidelberg. This jaw would be attributed later by Otto Schurtensack as Homo heidelbergensis. And it's the Mauer jaw that's been hypothesized as the inspiration for the fake remains at Piltdown. Although there were numerous archaeologists, anthropologists, and anatomists studying human evolution, there were only a few remains to go around to base theories off, and therefore the fledgling discipline of human evolution and archaeology was vulnerable to being manipulated. The beginnings of this story starts at Barkham Manor, which is a house in Sussex, in the small hamlet of Piltdown. This is where most of the Piltdown finds were made, although there would be other sites reported around the Piltdown area, not merely exclusively to Barkham Manor, but this is where most of the material came from. Allow me to introduce Charles Dawson. In this photograph, he looks like he stepped out of the pages of an Agatha Christie novel. But who was Charles Dawson? What was his background? Dawson was raised in a middle-class family, and he would go on to train and work as a solicitor, and he had a practice which is still there in Uckfield, which is a small town just east of Piltdown. Dawson wasn't ever officially trained in archaeology, he had no qualification in it, but he had been a very keen amateur since a very young age, and he was both an amateur in geology and archaeology, but also was a polymath on a variety of different subjects. He wrote over 50 different papers, and he was part of a variety of different societies, from the local Sussex Archaeology Society, the Geology Society, where he was a fellow, and he was also a fellow of the Society of the Antiquaries of London. Through all of these excursions, through all of his writings, he made some pretty good contacts within the Royal Society and the Natural History Museum as well. Charles Dawson is the discoverer of the Piltdown remains, and therefore that's why he's the number one suspect. But why would somebody of his standing want to create a hoax in the first place? Underneath the genial moustache veneer of Charles Dawson, there is a much darker side. We only really know about this now, thanks to the works of people like Russell Miles, who have discovered that Charles Dawson was tied to around 38 different fake or otherwise dodgy and unprovenance artefacts, and also was a likely plagiarizer. Out of all the artefacts that are listed within Dawson's dodgy collection, one in particular stands out, and that's his discovery of a fossilized tooth, which he actually christened as a new species called Plagiola dawsoni, Plagiola, a type of early mammal. On close inspection today, however, this tooth turned out to have been filed down. It's completely fake. It's to make it look like an early mammal tooth, but it's actually not at all. And this filing down of the tooth actually plays into how the Piltdown fossils were faked, and we'll come back to that point later. There are other pointers towards 
Dawson's dark character. Charles Dawson, as I said, was a member of the Sussex Archaeology Society, and that society occupied a building called Castle Lodge in Lewis, and they were renting it at the time. And they passed it on to Charles Dawson, once the building came up for sale, to go through the process of purchasing the building for the society. What happens next is slightly one-sided, as we only have the words of the Sussex Archaeology Society members, and not that of Charles Dawson. However, Charles Dawson, rather than purchasing Castle Lodge for the society, ended up buying the Castle Lodge for himself, and he moved himself and his family in, and booted the Sussex Archaeology Society out. Despite this negative interaction with the Sussex Archaeology Society, Charles Dawson was never given a bad rep amongst other members of the archaeology and geology world. He was able to achieve middling success with his fake papers and discoveries. However, Dawson doesn't seem to have been pleased with his minimal success. Even in correspondence to friends, he is noted as saying that he was waiting for the big one, which never seems to come. Charles Dawson, therefore, absolutely had the means and the motive to create the Piltdown forgery, and we'll go into how he would have done that now. There are several accounts of when Dawson obtained the very first Piltdown fossil, which was a thick piece of human skull extracted from the gravels of Piltdown around Barkham Manor. Barker Manor was where Charles Dawson was a custodian, and that's how he happened upon two men working in the gravel pits, and he claimed that this piece of skull came from them. This could have occurred between 1898 and 1911, but most people agree on a date of around 1908. Dawson would go on to contact paleontologist Arthur Smith Woodward in 1911 with his find. Arthur Smith Woodward was a high-ranking employee in the geology department at the Natural History Museum, and he was an expert in prehistoric fish. Charles Dawson and Arthur Smith Woodward knew each other from prior correspondence. This wasn't just a random encounter. The pair of them would go off to the grounds of Barker Manor in 1912, where they found more hominin bones and also stone tools and animal bones. With this assemblage, they would go to the Geological Society in December 1912, and they would announce a new species of human, Eoanthropus dawsoni, or as in English it's known, Dawson's Man of the Dawn. There would be a mixture of responses to the remains. The fragmented bones of the skull, teeth, and the piece of mandible presented to the society didn't seem quite right. The mandible was much too primitive for the skull which seemed too modern, and this is a comment which would haunt the discussion on the bones, amongst other whisperings, for the 41 years prior to the bones being revealed as a hoax. However, the fake bones miraculously, embarrassingly, were accepted as a whole, or at least in part, by swathes of anatomists and paleontologists across Britain and even internationally. You may well be wondering how on earth did so many archaeologists look at these remains and not immediately think this is an absolute joke. Well, remember that there was a very limited amount of information on human evolution at the time. These remains were also very new and didn't resemble any of the other species that had been found. There is also other things at play as well, and you have to take into consideration the other characters who were around during this time, and how their personal biases allowed the Piltdown hoax to proliferate. Anatomists like Sir Arthur Keith were sceptics, but would be led on by the remains. Keith certainly expressed initial concern about the disparity in the primitiveness of the jaw compared to that of the size of the skull, and he scoffed at the reconstructions of the skull made by Smith Woodward, and would make his own where the brain size of the Piltdown Man was much larger than projected by Smith Woodward. He would press for the remains to be classed as the genus Homo. He was an avid proponent of human evolution occurring within Europe. So a missing link type fossil that had been found in Britain played right into his bias. The skull of Piltdown Man would be embossed on the front cover of Arthur Keith's book, The Antiquity of Man. Arthur Keith would go on to describe the Piltdown Man as an evolutionary dead end in human evolution, but he would continue to defend the remains, and he would attack anybody who doubted the provenance of the Piltdown remains. This may have been a reason to why the Piltdown hoax was not uncovered for such a long time. 
Charles Dawson, in the years 1913 to 1915, would continue to bring visitors to the Barker Manor site. As in 1912, the hoaxer or hoaxers presumably planted additional finds of stone tools and animal bones, such as beaver and rhinoceros, which the visitors, or Charles Dawson mostly, would then discover. The site was completely artificial. One of the curious things about the stone artefacts from the Piltdown hoax is a large portion of earliths which Dawson and Smith found at Barker Manor. Earliths were a rather contentious topic at the time, and there was a division between those who believed that these stones were tools used by ancient humans, and there were those who were against them. Earliths, as we understand today, as in most cases, are regarded as totally natural bits of flint, which have been rolled around and bashed in places like rivers, and they give the false appearance that they've been worked by human hands. Dawson himself wasn't actually a proponent for earliths, and despite using these pieces to his advantage early on in the discoveries, he eventually backtracked on these being tools at all, likely to the chagrin of earphiles, people who were proponents of earliths. The point that everybody had missed during the initial discovery of the Piltdown remains was that earliths do not occur within the gravels of Piltdown. Furthermore, the few planted stone tools and the earliths in the Piltdown assemblage had been artificially stained brown so that they blended in with the brown Piltdown gravels. In a slightly funny aside, Charles Dawson had once given a talk on the natural formation of earliths and he demonstrated this using a bag of earliths which he had stained with chromate, which was openly done so and no one seemed to have put two and two together. One of the stranger findings from the Barker Manor site was the cricket bat. This oddly shaped piece of elephant bone caused excitement and confusion amongst the anthropologists. Excitement because because it was thought to be the oldest known human tool at the time, and confusion as to what it was actually used for. It looked worked, and so the idea was this could have been either a digging stick or some sort of club. Although now, people often wonder if this was some sort of sick joke made by the hoaxer. The Barkham Manor fossils were enough for some, but there were others who still found the singular site contentious. Dawson, who had been dubbed the Wizard of Sussex for his previous findings across Britain, miraculously found other sites in the areas surrounding Piltdown which supported the original Piltdown remains. Both of these sites are very vaguely provenanced by Dawson, which some at the time took to as being protective. In 1913, Charles Dawson claimed to have found a frontal part of a skull from a ploughed field, which confusingly is named Piltdown 3, and this is so because it wasn't publicly released until 1917, quite possibly because Smith Woodward, who Charles Dawson was corresponding with, was not initially convinced that the remains that Charles Dawson had found were those of the same type as Piltdown 1, mostly because the skull wasn't as the same thickness. The Piltdown 2 site, or the Sheffield Park site as it's also known, came in 1915, and this consisted of a frontal bone with an orbit, a nose root, and later on in the year, a molar. And these finds actually reinvigorated life into the belief of Piltdown, as it made it appear that Piltdown 1 was not an isolated case. These new remains conveniently fitted into the models of people like Smith Woodward and William Pycraft. So convenient that they were able to rebut many of the detractors who had been popping up ever since 1912. There were numerous detractors of the Piltdown remains, largely from the international scientific community as opposed to the British scientific community, and this may have been due to the fact that the international scientific community didn't have their judgement clouded by a sense of nationalistic pride from having the missing link remains. However, one of the earliest detractors was an English anatomist, Professor David Waterston, and he ridiculed the Piltdown remains in 1913, and he pointed out that the skull and the other bones were completely mismatched, and he even made comparison to chimpanzee remains. 
1915, an American academic, Garrett S. Miller Jr., laid out that the Piltdown jaw was much too ape-like and equated it to a chimp, and he actually came up with a new species, Panvita, some sort of European chimpanzee. In the bibliography for this paper, Miller actually lays out the thoughts of each different academic, and it's quite an interesting take on what the contemporary thought on various different people concerning the Piltdown remains was, and I suggest you go and read it, it's, it's, it's a quite a fascinating summation. Miller would receive backlash from, surprise, surprise, the British academics, in particular from the bulldog Sir Arthur Keith, and he was also quietly chided in correspondence to a friend of Smith Woodward's, where Smith Woodward described Miller as young and light-headed. The inspiration for this video came from a book that I have, which is the 1927 edition of The Men of the Old Stone Age by Henry Osborne. In that book, Miller's comments are stuck in the appendix and not in the main text themselves, which I thought was quite interesting. But Henry Osborne himself was one of the middle ground people. He wasn't really sure where to put Piltdown. He believed in it, but he wasn't sure where Piltdown fit in the human tree. But he pressed for more of a, a side branch, more of like an evolutionary dead end. That seems to be where most people were coming from at the time. As time passed, people became more tired of the Piltdown remains, and I think one of the most damning comments comes from a German scientist, Franz Weidenreich, and he says, quote, The sooner the Chimera Eoanthropus is erased from the list of human fossils, the better for science. Oof. Returning to the earlier 20th century, however, in 1915, Charles Dawson had made his final Piltdown discovery. He had been experiencing failing health in that year, likely suffering from some anemic condition, and he died in 1916 of septicemia, aged 52. He was mourned by many people in the academic community, including Arthur Smith Woodward, who gave him a very touching eulogy and went on to raise an inscribed sandstone monolith dedicated to his memory at the location of the first Piltdown find. And by some coincidence, with the death of Charles Dawson, there were no more finds made at Barker Manor, despite various attempts by later people, including Arthur Smith Woodward, to find more Piltdown remains. In my view, one of the saddest occurrences of the hoax was that even after the death of Charles Dawson, Arthur Smith Woodward continued to periodically work in the Barkham area from 1916 up until 1937, and he found nothing. And that just brings that scene from Holes, where Arthur Smith Woodward is going, well, that's too damn bad, to some poor labourer who's been sieving and smashing through gravel and achieving zero. Smith Woodward himself would die in 1944, and one of his last major works on Piltdown, known as The First Englishman, was posthumously released in 1948. Before I interjected with stupid homemade memes, I stated that the Piltdown remains had been losing traction, and they'd been losing traction long before the death of Arthur Smith Woodward. And this came from the more recent discoveries of other fossils, which started to make Piltdown look a little bit odd and suspicious. The discovery of the Neanderthal Swanscombe skull in Kent, for example, was made in 1935. And this demonstrated from accurate dating of the surrounding gravels of Swanscombe in comparison to those of Piltdown, which had very recently been mapped, showed that the Piltdown gravels were much younger than the Swanscombe skull, which seemed much more modern than the Eoanthropus skull, and these two things did not add up at all, and Eoanthropus would be continually pushed to a side branch of human evolution as more and more discoveries were made, not just in England, but across Asia and Africa, and the whole fossil of Piltdown started to become very embarrassing, but this didn't stop people like like Sir Arthur Keith and Arthur Smith Woodward from writing papers and books on the subject. There was mounting evidence against the Piltdown remains, however, nothing would really be proven until the late 1940s, 
1949, finally, the hoax would begin to unravel, and this really begins with Kenneth Oakley, who conducted fluorine testing to get to the bottom of the dating of the Piltdown remains. Fluorine testing indicates the level of fluoride absorption of a fossil. That's a relatively continuous rate. The more the fluoride in the remains, the longer that bone's been in the ground. Oakley's fluoride test definitively showed that there were very low levels of fluoride in the Piltdown fossils, indicating that these were not antiquated at all. Oakley would then go on to form a team with Joseph Weiner and Wilfred Legros Clark. This trio would then conduct hard analysis of the remains for the first time, and they would release their findings in 1953. This very dense paper systematically went through all of the Piltdown remains and refuted them one by one and demonstrated how each of the remains were faked. The cliff notes of this paper was that the initial finding of the Piltdown fossils, that thick skull fragment, was shown to be a Homo sapiens skull, likely bearing some sort of pathology which thickened the skull. The jawbone was that of a modern ape, and the teeth that were within that jawbone had been filed down to make them seem more human-like. Furthermore, as we discussed earlier in the video, they identified the artificial staining of the flints and also the bones, which had been stained with an iron solution to make them appear brown like the Piltdown gravels. The cricket bat that they showed that came from a fossilised elephant bone had also been worked with a steel knife. There were so many people accused in this hoax, and so far I've only talked about some very key characters. And I'm not going to mention every single suspect, I'm only going to talk about a few here now. So many different people have been accused as being the hoaxer that I've only talked about the main characters so far of the story to keep everything streamlined. I'm not going to get into every single different person. I'll just mention a couple of the main ones who have also been accused on top of Charles Dawson. People like, for example, the French Jesuit priest Pierre Tilliard de Chardin. He had once been part of the Piltdown excavations early on in 1913, and he even found at least one of the fossils at Barker Manor. But I think the case against him isn't particularly strong. He would become a detractor of Piltdown later on in his life, and he very much distanced himself from the whole situation. Furthermore, he wasn't at most of the excavations where the Piltdown fossils were found, at Barker Manor from 1914 onwards. Arthur Smith Woodward, of course, was a suspect, having wholeheartedly dedicated the latter part of his career to the Piltdown fossils. Considering, however, he spent 20 years fruitlessly revisiting Barker Manor, he was likely blissfully ignorant of the hoax, and he died before it was revealed in 1953, which in some ways was a small mercy, as his reputation was tarnished, and having to answer to all of those questions and being shown how naive he was, that would have been incredibly destructive for him, and it's probably a good thing he didn't live to see that being revealed. Even the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, had been theorised as the hoaxer. Doyle actually lived very close to Piltdown, and he was also acquainted with both Charles Dawson and Arthur Smith Woodward. However, the overall case against Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is quite a weak one, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence that he was able to go to Barker Manor and plant a variety of different fossils. Also, he would have to have planted fossils in the wider area for Charles Dawson, Dawson to discover. Joseph Weiner in his 1955 book did lean towards Charles Dawson as the suspect, and he did accuse him in a very indirect way, possibly as a way to circumnavigate any potential litigation from family members, but later on in his life he would go on to take a stronger stance against Charles Dawson as the main suspect, and most people see Charles Dawson today as a lone hoaxer. One very tantalising piece of evidence that could have been used to implicate Charles Dawson as a fraudster early on in the 1900s only came around from Joseph Weiner's investigations in the 1950s. One person seems to have realised very early on about the inauthentic nature about at least part of the Piltdown assemblage. Harry Morris, who was an amateur archaeologist and a bank teller, was an avid eophile, and he traded one of the Piltdown earliths that Dawson had for some unknown and valuable item. 
Harry Morris at some point prior to the death of Charles Dawson had realised that the earlith he had obtained was artificially stained with an iron solution and he wrote several notes amongst the collection that variously implicated Charles Dawson as a fraudster. One note in particular says, stained by Dawson with intent to defraud. If Morris knew that the earliths were fraudulent, why did he never come forward? Maybe Harry Morris was aware that he would have to have faced heavyweights like Sir Arthur Keith and also Arthur Smith Woodward, and it's also possible that Harry Morris didn't want to further damage the case for earliths being worked stone tools, and so he let Charles Dawson carry on his illicit activities. The fact that Charles Dawson allowed for one of his fake artifacts to fall into the hands of a very potential detractor likely indicates that Charles Dawson was aware that Harry Morris would not come forward. Harry Morris unfortunately died before the hoax was revealed, and only some accounts from his acquaintances suggest that he may have told a few people his suspicions, but these clearly went nowhere. The case was reinvigorated in the late 1970s. During renovation works in the Natural History Museum, a trunk was discovered bearing the initials M-A-C-H for Martin Alistair Campbell Hinton. In the trunk were various documents which conclusively showed they belonged to Martin Hinton, as well as a collection of fossil fragments, stained fossil fragments. In 1996, analysis was performed on these fossils by Professor Brian Gardner, and it was shown that they had the same type of staining as the ones in the Piltdown hoax case. Martin Hinton had not been a suspect in Joseph Weiner's 1955 discussion, and Hinton himself doesn't seem to have been at the Piltdown excavations, but he was working at the Natural History Museum in the zoology department from 1910. Martin Hinton's potential motive might have been revenge, and this would have been aimed at Arthur Smith Woodward. Prior to his employment, Hinton was largely a volunteer at the Natural History Museum, and during the early 1900s he made a request to Arthur Smith Woodward for a paid position to catalogue a collection. From then on, Martin Hinton may have harboured an absolute hatred for Arthur Smith Woodward and went on to create fake finds to plant at Barker Manor so that he could embarrass Woodward and ruin his reputation. Martin Hinton seems to have been a very whimsical character and he made very vague claims against more than one person. Apparently Martin Hinton once said to a BBC producer John Irving in 1953, quote, I know who it was, they work in the Natural History Museum, but I won't tell you as a man has to die with his secret. Hinton made vague claims against other people as well, but he never made his convictions entirely known. Dawson was never one of the people he blamed. There are numerous people who now believe that Martin Hinton was in cahoots with Charles Dawson and may have been the one to supply Dawson with the fossils or even stain the fossils for him to get back at Arthur Smith Woodward. However, there are many people who also don't believe in the Martin Hinton theory. Dr. Miles Russell, for example, in his 2003 book, The Secret Life of Charles Dawson, suggested that the stained bones were actually Martin Hinton's attempts to recreate how the Piltdown bones were faked in an experiment to see how the hoaxer worked. However, Martin Hinton never seems to have mentioned doing such an experiment. The latest update of the Piltdown hoax came in 2016, which involved analysis by a collection of archaeologists and scientists to do more modern analysis of the Piltdown remains. The paper attempted to use DNA, XLR testing, carbon dating and CT scanning. There were a, a mixture of results. The analysis of the Piltdown 1 and 2 molars showed definitively that they were from an orangutan, as long had been suspected, and more specifically they were from the same Bornean orangutan. Previous analysis of the skull bone showed that they were from Homo sapiens, and they may have been up to two individuals of probable medieval date. The 2016 study attempted DNA and to redate the bones, however both methods failed. They did conclude, however, that maybe up to three different human individuals are included amongst the Piltdown assemblage. 
Further analysis on the physical construction of the hoax was also undertaken, and the authors identified that the Piltdown forger was unlikely to have been trained in conservation, having made numerous errors during the construction of the bones, including the fracturing of the bones when attempting to forcibly put the tooth roots back into the jaw, and the putty that had been used for holding the doctor teeth in place and it setting too fast. The bones from the various Piltdown sites all had very similar methods of doctoring and it was decided that they were all the workings of the same person. And in the conclusion, the authors suggest that Charles Dawson made the bones and that he was working alone in the hoax. One of the slightly frustrating things about this paper is that they did not attempt to test the Martin Hinton fossils, and although they very briefly acknowledged them in the paper, they dismissed Martin Hinton's entire involvement in the case, but I think it would be wise to go on and do further testing of the Martin Hinton fossils and see if there is a similarity in how they were created and if they were made by the same person before we can completely write them off. A very fascinating point I came across during the research into this video is that the Piltdown hoax was not especially an isolated case, and there have been archaeological hoaxes which are very similar to this one. In California in 1866, for example, a human skull from a mine was reportedly found by a group of miners, and this discovery was leapt upon by a geologist called J.D. Whitney. Whitney had theories about ancient humans cohabitating America with megafaunas like mastodons, and he used the skull from the mine as evidence for his theories, although it would transpire later that the miners had likely purloined the skull from a nearby Native American burial ground and had used it to trick people like J.D. Whitney. What is especially fascinating, however, is that scientific testing was used to disprove that this was an old skull. In 1879, fluorine testing was successfully used upon the skull, and it demonstrated that the skull was not as old as Whitney was claiming. And this is the exact same method that Oakley used in 1949, 70 years later on the Piltdown case. The case of the Calavera skull indicates that we had the means and the methods to successfully disprove archaeological hoaxes. So why were such methods not employed early on after the discovery of the Piltdown remains? There were many detractors of the Piltdown fossils as we discussed, however it's perhaps their allegations either went unheard by the key players of the Piltdown story, or they were just simply shrugged off when Piltdown 2 and Piltdown 3 were revealed, and otherwise the allegations just went uninvestigated. This might have been likely due to the original remains not being disseminated to the wider academic world, and they were kept in the Natural History Museum where very few people were allowed to access them. Also, the Piltdown finds would fit in with theories and models of high-ranking and well-respected people like Arthur Smith Woodward, so why would you question such a well-respected person? It also comes down to the fact that people like Arthur Smith Woodward and Sir Arthur Keith, they wanted to believe in the remains. This was the first Englishman, and it would blow out all the remains that had come out of the continent over the 19th century out of the water. Matters were further complicated by the very limited knowledge of human evolution. The discrepancies between an individual with such a large brain, yet had a very ape-like jaw, would fit into popular views and on the trajectory of human evolution that was held at the time of the early 20th century. To paraphrase what John McNabb said in 2006, the hoaxer was able to exploit the large gaps within the knowledge of human evolution and local geology, and the hoaxer was able to fill those gaps with erroneous finds and drip-fed them to people like Woodward and the wider archaeological world to circumnavigate any disputes about the finds that would arise. I don't want to sound too sanctimonious, but perhaps it, overall it was hubris that allowed the Piltdown hoax to proliferate. People placed too much trust in those who were in positions of power, but in reality had very little understanding of what was going on, and maybe they never spoke out, fearing for their own positions or having their own views scrutinised, and so they never spoke out with much tenacity in papers and journals, and may have just resided to talking about it amongst their academic friends. 
The naivety of the academic community, as well as the misunderstanding of human evolution for the time, is best exemplified in the following quote from William Solas, who said this in 1915. Some have regarded such as being as an improbable monster, and have suggested that the jaw may not have belonged to the skull, but to a true ape. The chances against this are, however, so overwhelming that the conjecture may be dismissed as unworthy of serious consideration. Nor on reflection need the combination of characters presented by Eoanthropus occasion surprise. It had indeed been long previously anticipated as an almost necessary stage in the course of human development. In conclusion then, the Piltdown hoax was certainly an embarrassment to the relatively young discipline of archaeology when it was finally revealed in 1953, and we can largely blame this on people who having a inexperience of human evolution. There's just the data just simply wasn't there. However, there were also things like personal bias at play, nationalism, and also how people's attitudes towards their peers were demonstrated. It wasn't as easy to peer review somebody's work. Whereas now, since the Piltdown remains, it resulted in a stronger research ethic and peer review processes are much better across the discipline. The hoaxer still hasn't been conclusively identified. We can say for almost certain that Charles Dawson likely knew what he was doing and that he was at least 90% of the problem. However, there are people who would disagree and say that Charles Dawson did not know at all. Or it might be that Charles Dawson had an accomplice. Like I said, it would be great to get those Martin Hinton fossils identified to see if there is anything to that. But I think it will likely always remain questionable as to who committed the Piltdown hoax. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know there are lots of videos and documentaries about the Piltdown hoax out there, but the ones that I did watch, they didn't quite satisfy my obsession and I had to go on and make one for myself just to get it out of my system. I know my girlfriend will be very pleased that I no longer have to bring up the Piltdown hoax every dinner time as it's now gone. I no longer want to talk about the Piltdown Oaks. 